one and i'm recording uh, okay so i'm with faisal how are you faisal <laughs> i'm good son how are you? excellent excellent cool 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 well, it's nice to connect uh thank you uh for coming on i you know usually start with uh where did we first meet or you know where did how do we first connect um if i'm not mistaken i literally think someone referred to you as like some sort of ninja of sorts, like the first time I ever heard about you. So I was super nervous getting on a call with you. Just okay. so you know, somebody was like, look, there's this guy, he's a compliance ninja. We just brought him on board. I remember it was like back in the Buttercoin days. You remember that? <laughs> I remember the Buttercoin days. Yeah, I remember meeting you there. Yeah, that was great. That was a while back. What was that, 2012, 2013? 2012 and and for maybe some people who don't know the story i you know i i, I yeah. think back to those buttercoin days quite often and i i really yeah. cherish those moments because i don't know I oh mean, i do too you know yeah. what i mean it's like i, I uh, think we a, do for the same reason too yeah so maybe let, let's let's start there a bit uh sure. what maybe just for, to set some context what was buttercoin in a sentence or two uh yeah so buttercoin was a, a bitcoin exchange uh based in the united states um servicing mostly um, U.S. customers, um, and yeah, it, it was founded by Cedric. Uh, Buttercoin was also out of the Y Combinator uh, group of that year, and I think I was employee number three, uh, Cedric or four. Cedric and Bennett had just um, got the domain name Buttercoin.com, and an attorney that we're talking with said, "You know, one of the things you'll probably need is someone um, to." sort of work the compliance part of your company. And she knew me and that's how that whole relationship and conversation started. Um, and it's funny because I do remember Cedric used to say, you're a compliance ninja. I wasn't, uh, I think it, it was it was only because I had a compliance background and I was very interested in, in Bitcoin uh, or crypto at that time. And I think I was extremely rare in the amount of individuals at that time that saw the potential and long-term potential of Bitcoin. So, and it was extremely difficult to just find other people that were from the compliance background to give any kind of importance to Bitcoin at all or crypto at all. So he liked my open-mindedness and sort of what I thought about crypto um, and so on. That's how we started. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, I thought, you know, cause I mean, Google, uh, I think was one of the Google Ventures or rather was one of the investors. Yep. I, I yep. remember Reddit, I think Alexi Johanian mm -hmm. and all these like really, you know, interesting people that um, I don't know, as someone who's from Canada was always kind of like, oh, Google, like, you know, yeah. Silicon Valley. Yeah. So the, that, that for me, that was like the moment where it was really interesting. It was like, like I said, like I said, I, I learned a lot. Um, okay. So, so like I was telling you, Faisal, you know, one of my main kind of goals, like I was saying, is I find it very, very interesting in terms of, uh, trying to capture not necessarily like oh all time highs oh we're down 10 or oh, we're up 10 percent like to me that's a bit of noise and it's less interesting in the kind of arc of time yeah. uh what is interesting however to me are the stories right and so like the people like you said you know i mean 2012 2013 i mean that was in that, that sounds like a lifetime ago i mean 10 years in bitcoin is like what like a thousand normal years or something i don't even know but it, it's oh, insane man. right yeah. so so uh, so one of my goals is again as like people are trying to rush into this space is to share these stories of like how we this space even got to where it is right mm. so some people start with like their great great grandparents or something some people start with their first job uh some people start wherever they want i'd be curious where, where does for you where does your story begin and i'll just shut up after this but like i'll preface it by saying that i don't know if this applies to you but to me and for a lot of others it's like we see bitcoin as a bit of like a singularity meaning it changed the way we maybe thought things were possible and like uh and uh and, and so 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 i love to capture the story uh before you learned about bitcoin and then kind of afterwards and you know what what you know kind of came out of that afterwards and, and you know and yeah so curious yeah. where where does faisal's story begin well faisal's story uh, begins a while back but that's not very interesting i'll tell you i got into the crypto space um before that i i was a compliance analyst for investment securities and then i quickly got accelerated into compliance for um, high-risk payment processing, uh, which is a whole other story altogether. But the way I really got pushed or fell into the Bitcoin rabbit hole was prior to that, one of the things I was doing was um, I had hooked up my computer to the SETI project. 
the search for extraterrestrial intelligence project and you could essentially you know donate your unused cpu um for the betterment of mankind right so just process mm -hmm, a lot of mm -hmm. data and um so that was going on for a while and i and i thought i was doing something great by you know um, helping humanity with something that really wasn't costing me anything um, right. and on the forum of that one of the individuals said hey you know, you could make money by the same thing you're doing and essentially talking to all all people that were logged into SETI and said, um, if you run this thing called Bitcoin, you can actually get money. Um, and so I kind of went, well, what is that? What? So I remember, and at that point, at that time, uh, netbooks were a thing. <laughs> so this is 2011, uh, early, early yeah. 2011. I fired up my netbook and read the Bitcoin white paper um, and first I got a little bit of it, but then I thought, ah, it doesn't make sense. Uh, but he said I could make money off of it just by letting it run. Okay. So download it, run it. And that was it. I just left it there. And I remember a few months after I got a block of 50 and I'd said 50 uh, in there, because back then you could actually run it on a GPU and get a block of 50 right away with relative. When was this? What year? 20, what? 2011. This is mid 20, 2011. Yeah. And I've got a so block. You just run your laptop for whatever a night or two. No, I switched got, to like, GPU because they were, they were GPU, okay. GPUs are better for that. Yeah. And um, so because CPUs were not, they had already outscaled CPUs. So GPUs were, were needed. And then came ASX, right? But uh, ran a GPU, got a 50. I remember looking at that and it actually had no value at that point. Um, I think it was something like four decimals. One was worth one Bitcoin or something like that. So 50 was worth really nothing. Um, I... I, I took the wallet off and I put it onto that netbook and I just left it there. Um, months, months go by and I hear about Bitcoin again. Um, I go, wait, this is still a thing? So I went back, read again, saw what people were talking about. And now there were more people really interested into it. Again, the value hadn't really gone up. Gave that up for a while. And then by that time, the netbook had already disappeared and gone. Um, but at some point when the news about the guy trading for pizza, do you remember that famous story? Of course, story? That, that's like that's the like, story. Yeah, story right? <laughs> wait, wait um, and why is that important? Because was that the point where Bitcoin found some sort of market value? Well, the, the public kind of sort of. Right, it yeah, was the, the public, first public mentioning of a trade of value for something that your computer did, right? You, you, essentially, you were able to feed yourself by something a computer did. That in itself is a very powerful statement, right? Before that, the way of you know acquiring food is like you have to do toil and labor to be able to acquire something. But your computer did something you ate, so that Got was you. that. That was yeah. very interesting, and I found that I found the fact that people, someone actually decided to do that, meant that there was some kind of intrinsic value to it. Means hmm. that the value was no longer pegged to itself, but about what other people attributed towards it. Now the the purity of the mathematics was lost on me for a while. Uh, I, I essentially later got convinced about the intrinsic uh, nature of it. Uh, you know, when I learned from smarter people about um, how cryptocurrencies were designed initially, but the fact that people assign value to it is extremely important. But I actually didn't see that. When I remember reading that and thinking, everybody else was thinking, oh, the value could go up. I wasn't thinking that. I was thinking, hang on a second. Someone just exchanged US dollar currency for something something currency and coming from a compliance background i thought okay this is going to this is there is going to be an intersection where at some point in time people will trade and they will trade for us dollar currency and that has vast compliance implications especially if someone is doing it on an open scale with retail customers and i said okay i think i think i need to figure out if there is a compliance issue here and whether i can be beneficial towards it because i know people will be engaging in that type of transaction. And so I started studying more and more just about cryptocurrency, listening to a lot more interesting and intelligent people about cryptocurrency, looking at what guidelines were around there for cryptocurrency. And um, there really wasn't any, there wasn't any best practice. This is 2012 now, right? Uh, there wasn't any best practices really. Um, no one had any idea how to actually apply it. And if you're in financial services, how do you manage it was unknown. But I, I remember writing a presentation for a, um, so they had invited me to speak at a conference in San Francisco called the Emerging Payment Conference. And my presentation was about cryptocurrency. 
Mm. And I remember writing about how the future AML compliance officer will have to deal with the idea of being a crypto compliance officer. Um, and I remember presenting it and roughly 200, 250 of my colleagues in there essentially thought I was crazy saying, I can't believe he thinks this will be serious. Um, which is actually funny because a lot of them obviously are still in the compliance space and I see them on LinkedIn proclaim themselves as crypto compliance experts. Uh, so that's always fun <laughs> to see, but I love that they're still, they're, they're actually in the crypto space. So, you know, all, 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 all past sins are forgiven. Um, but I, I do remember that giving that presentation and then having to fly off to New York for another presentation a few days later. And in those days, FinCEN published a guideline called a uh, guideline on cryptocurrencies and virtual currencies. That was the March 2013 guidance about how cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency companies that engage in exchange related transactions or administrative related transactions would be considered money service business and would essentially have to abide by US regulatory law. And that was, you know, basically the, the boom of um, how regulation and enforcement was carried out. I had to rewrite my whole presentation and essentially give a bridge down version of what that regulation meant in that conference there. Um, but that that was from the beginning to how everything else explodes. Fascinating. Um, and, and so just a couple of questions. So we'll have a whole bunch, but 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 the most like the big pink elephant question I have is is okay, so one of my goals with this is, is I'm calling this like building on Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin stories of building on Bitcoin is kind of the theme, if you will. And I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get people to realize that um, that it's possible to build on top of Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. And you don't even need to technically ask anyone for permission. You can just start. But yeah. once Bitcoin starts to hit the real world, there are you know real challenges that come up. And as an entrepreneur, as a business developer in this space for almost 10 years, mm -hmm. I've almost uh, come to the conclusion that like that the, that the building the tech is almost the easiest part. <laughs> Um, the hardest part, or one of the hardest parts, um, you know, I, I've interviewed guys like Addison, Nishid Desai, who was our lawyers in India, who fought the court case recently in India. Yeah. I've been trying to put a spotlight on, on you know, people who think about compliance. And, and, and so, so I guess the, the question I have then is, is why, why, why should people care? If somebody's now thinking of making a move into the Bitcoin space, building a company, why does compliance matter? For you, it's obvious, but uh, curious, yeah, for the- well, I mean there are there are a lot of products and services you can build that don't actually have any regulatory compliance issue i mean the the least the smallest component you can prob probably think of is more about information security related compliance and if you're dealing with customers maybe consumer protection so you can actually build a lot of products which have very little regulatory um you know implications but if you deal in client facing services and or retail facing services where you're interacting with um, any number of traditional in financial instruments, um, you're essentially working in their territory. Like you might be using cryptocurrency as the basis of your offering, but if you're, if you're touching those products, you're dealing in the domain of the regulator. So you, you absolutely have to abide by the, the, the laws that are there. Now you might not like a lot of the regulations that are there. You might think they're, uh, very onerous. You might have philosophical differences against it, but you're playing in that territory. Therefore, you need to follow those rules, um, which is not any different than if someone was, you know, let's say you had a preferred type of programming language and someone decided to code in that language. You have rules of that language that you have to follow as well. So it's sort of like your domain rules. And if you're touching that domain, you have to follow those rules. It's I think that's the best way I can describe that. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's that's beautifully said. And and so yeah, it is a choice, right? I guess at the end of the day, and in people, if they choose to build something on the blockchain per se or whatever, so, you know, um, and maybe there's where the users, I don't know. The point is, is there are businesses models out there that don't require. But if you're going to be, you know, interfacing with uh, retail, then. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I like that, whether you believe in it or not. And I think that's where a lot of Bitcoiners kind of fall apart. Like lately, I've been trying to put a spotlight on, you know, the travel rule. 
Like people don't yeah. even talk about it, but it's like now that Brian Armstrong brought it up recently, people are talking about it, but it's like, mm-hmm. it surprises me that people don't even That's like, think one. about this. Yeah, so, that is a big one. So I actually did like a two hour episode with, uh, with some people on it, but sure. I, I'm curious, I'm curious, like, can you do, a, maybe it's hard to do a TLDR. Um, and I know this is more about Bitcoin stories and your focus, but it's just, I sure. just feel like this is the, the elephant in the room, right? It's like, uh, people need to think yeah. about it. So if you're dealing, yeah. yeah, if you're dealing US dollars and any type of fiat currencies, one of the things that have always existed for the longest amount of time is that when money travels, the information about that money travels with it, right? So whether that's nationally or internationally, whether you're doing cross-border payments or national payments, money doesn't just travel, the information of the money also travels with it. Now, what's that information? Well, the information includes who the buyer is, some details about the buyers and depending on the transaction, who the recipient is and some details about the recipient. So the information about the money travels with the money. That's always been true of all financial instruments nationally and internationally. The issue is that when you engage in cryptocurrencies that are mostly working like payment systems and you've got regulatory or intelligence groups such as FATA, for example, that's reviewing it in this through the same lens that, as which they've reviewed in the past, they're going to also come up with the idea, well, if money travels, whether that's cryptocurrency or not, the information about the money has to travel with it. Meaning who the sender is, where it's going, and by who, it doesn't mean the address. Just like in the in the traditional sense, it doesn't mean the account number, it means the individual's name. In cryptocurrency, it's also who the person is and in the recipient of who the person is. That is a significant challenge for the cryptocurrency area because there are a bunch of transactions that will happen in the course of a cryptocurrency transaction that are not designed for people. In other words, whether that's you know change transactions or spend transactions that are reversed, those are not necessarily going to go to any people. Those are actually going to go to you know machines or just different wallets as changes, so on and so forth. So having that identity is extremely difficult. On top of that, there are a lot of transactions that could happen between me and you. So let's say there are 10 different transactions that happen between me and you. There are five of them that are not essential to the core transaction that I'm sending to you. Those could be change transactions as well. But if you read how the travel rule applies, we actually have to identify who it's coming to and who it's sending to, uh, who's coming from and sending to. The third layer of difficulty is if you're, um, let's say you've got a wallet on an exchange and you're sending to an off um, exchange wallet that belongs to you. Well, the exchange doesn't actually, that's holding your keys at that point, doesn't actually know that the off-site wallet is yours, but there is a burden on them to then find out and identify the recipient address, which is you. Well, my question is, so let's say you ask it, how do you actually know that's their address, right? How do you actually know that's their wallet? There there isn't a way to be able to identify it. What if the wallet is a hardware wallet? So how do you identify that hardware wallet is now Faisal's, right? There isn't a way to be able to identify it. So it's not a question of, it's, it's not a question of whether it cannot be applied or shouldn't be applied. It's a question of logistically, it, it's so much pro- it causes such problems that a correct answer for a lot of companies in order to be able to comply with this would actually be, I don't know. That is actually a correct answer that some will face. And so regulators don't like the answer, I don't know, even though that is the correct answer for some of these situations. And that's why people are a little bit worried about it because how do you, how do you account for these situations? Um, I think, I think in this sense, the regulatory guidelines were set with the tail end of the issues. So if you think about financial crime as, as it relates to all of financial transactions, the, you know, the proportion of financial crime is only the tail ends or very, very small amount of all financial transactions and regulation is supposed to mirror the vast majority of transactions or at least enable the vast majority of them but the regulation has been put in place here only for the very tail end of the vast proportion of these transactions so that's that's definitely disheartening cuz you know that's not how it's supposed to be intended um, how is it going to be solved i have no idea um, I, I don't have the answer for it i think there are a few groups that are actually working very really hard on it um, so if you think about several blockchain groups or blockchain lobby groups, there are quite a few of those. Some of them are excellent. Um, you know, they've got a lot of people working on figuring out how to be able to apply uh, the travel rule if it applies to you and maybe work with legislators to make sure that that rule is further de- refined so it doesn't apply just unanimously. And the, and the date, am I mistaken? The date, I think, got, got pushed, right? In yeah, it was supposed to be the, in uh, for the last year that... and then it got pushed. But in some countries, it's already um, live. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, let, you know what? Sorry, there's so many yeah. things, but let, let's go back. I want to really capture your sure. story, Faisal, as well. Um, so, so you know, one of the things that, um, again, that that I'm trying to get across is like, okay, you play with this Bitcoin thing. Okay, you see that there's perhaps this market opportunity. You go to the extent of going on stage in front of all your peers <laughs> and presenting to them that you know you believe that this is going to be something very yeah. important. Um, so what next? How do you like you know? Um, how, how do you how do you how do you kind of like uh, you know focus your cannons like towards this direction so that you know? Because I think if I'm not mistaken, didn't you like help develop one of the courses? I think here in Canada for training uh, compliance people and and you've done a lot of work in it, but I'm just wondering like, how do you go? Like, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like a black box, like especially back then now, okay, everybody and their dogs talking about it mm. and hedge fund managers and all these famous guys. But it's like, back then it was like crickets, right? It was yeah, crickets. You, <laughs> you read a white paper. Well, you have to believe that what you know thus far is, so, you know, at any given point in time, we know very little, but if you know, if you have a high amount of confidence in the least amount of knowledge that you know, that's enough to be able to keep going forward, right? A lot of times people don't go forward because they don't believe that the information that they know, they're not confident about the information that they know. Now, back then I knew mm. very little, but I was very sure in, in the littleness of what I knew. And cryptocurrency as a whole, uh, when I understood, uh, like the, the key moment was when I understood that all of it was based on math, um, that in itself was me, was essentially a defining factor for me. Okay. I don't have to know, like, I don't have to be more sure. Uh, math is sure enough for me, so I should keep going in this discipline. I should be able to try to uh, work as much as possible in it. And if I can provide some value to other people in this space, then so be it. So I try to sort of like talk to as many people as possible. Because for me, I think it was my dad I was talking to, and I told him that it was based on math. And he says, oh, then no one really invented anything. It was discovered. And that was very powerful for me because... You know, math in itself existed before humans did, right? And so if you think about a Bitcoin, which essentially is boiled down to math, it, it basically in nature means that it existed before we did. And because it, it existed before we did, then we didn't actually invent anything. We just discovered it, um, which means that it's a truth that has existed before us. So if we come across it, then we should actually be able to try to harvest it. And we are harvesting it right now by using cryptocurrency. So... Um, I, I just had to be sure that it was definitely based on math. And as long as that was true, then I could do whatever else I wanted to in that space. And, and, and again, before even maybe coming into this also, can you talk a little bit about what maybe your relationship to math, money, and computers were? Like, were you, uh, did you, did you geek out on computers like a lot of us or were you more yes, like I was definitely, timid and, yeah. Also on, on the subject of math, um, I was always interested in it. But there was this one student in my class, her name was Mindy Huang. I, I was with her primary school, college, university. Like we essentially travel, we had the same sort of discipline, but I was never better than her. She was always better than me. Um, so ma I couldn't call myself a mad genius or math wizard of any kind, but I was always interested in it. My favorite book to this day um, happens to be um, Fermat's Enigma. It is by far the most interesting, interesting book I've ever read. And I always uh, invite people to read about it. I mean, it's just you know, if you read, if you're someone that doesn't like math or you want to convince someone to like math, you should read Fermat's Enigma. It's What's the TLDR or like of it? Or I mean, it's probably hard to do that. But. No, it's not. It's actually not hard to do that at all because okay. that's, that, that's actually the crux of the story. So um, everyone knows the Pythagoras theorem, X squared plus Y plus yep. squared. Okay. So uh, Fermat, um, back when he was alive, wrote on the margins of one of his books that he found the proof to X to N plus Y to N equals Z, Z to N. And he, he found the proof that he found that proof. And he essentially wrote in the margin of his notebook that it's too big to write here. That was, that was it. So when he died, being that he was a great mathematician, that they found this writing, they said, well, hang on a second. Did you really find the proof or did he not? And his proof was that it doesn't exist. Um, so different branches of mathematics has been, had been sort of discovered, not discovered, but sort of, uh, yeah, I would say discovered and made uh, over the last 300 years to be able to prove that theorem. And all the branches of mathematics that developed as a result of that is just absolutely amazing. So you can think about fractals, game theory, um, pure number theory, all these different great, great branches of mathematics were built as a quest to solve that theorem. 
And so that book de delves into all the disciplines of mathematics that were built and all the individuals that were at the center of those disciplines all the way until uh, Professor Wiles in, in Princeton actually solved it in the uh, um, late 60s. Sorry, don't quote me on that year. But Professor Wiles at Princeton solved it. Um, he actually solved it first, realized it was actually a mistake, then he solved it again and it was correct. But that book was fascinating because it taught me a lot about just loving mathematics as a whole. There are things from there I still remember that just still blow my mind. Like, um, you know, the number 26 is between the number 25 and 27. 25 is a square of five and 27 is a cube of three. So consider the number 26 as a number between powers, right? It's between a power of a number, which is 25, and a power of another number, 27. Well, there's proof that no other, no other number till infinity exists that's like that. I mean, the fact that you can actually make the exclamation that that doesn't exist, and then you've, you can prove that it doesn't exist, it's just amazing to me. It's just beautiful in that sense. Um, but I had a friend of mine who was a real mathematician who said, yeah, you find it romantic because you haven't actually studied mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's, it's easy for people that are not specialized in mathematics to find their romance behind it. Um, right, but right, that's, right. But g given that um, I, I still was very, you know, I was very motivated by the romance and things, especially, especially in mathematics, which is, you know, for the, for the most part, the most probably unromantic thing that they can be. And then computers? Um, did you get one? How, what was your first one? You remember it or 386? Yeah, yeah it was a it was a Intel 386. <laughs> yeah, uh, in 1991 cool. with a 14.4 nice. kbps modem. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. Yep. And um, at that time, my father, who was a professor, um, had internet access through his university mm. uh, called a Vax2 net, and we were able to have it at home, dial up to the computer to the university's network to be able to get on um, get online. It was all text based. Um, it was great because when you were in tech space, you could actually do a lot of things that I liked at a time, which I used to read a lot of fantasy books. So you could actually enter different chat rooms that did what's called MUDs, M-U-Ds, multi-user dungeons, mm -hmm, which were mm -hmm. essentially text-based D&D games or cool. just text-based games in general. So I got into computers very early on, 91, I want to say. And, um, you know, then on every, and I'm very thankful. If I was to boil down the biggest contribution that my parents um had in my life was my dad got me set up on an internet and computer very early, um, earlier than all my friends and so on. So I, I was able to sort of get interested just in the technology space as a whole. So that's probably what I'm very thankful about. And 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 on the uh, on the money front, had you traveled a bit, or were you? Are you from you're from Canada, obviously, right? Or yeah, I mean, I, I hadn't traveled personally as much, but until I was about 12, I think I visited roughly 67 countries because my father was, was a professor, but he was also Six a traveling to seven? professor. Sorry? Six, Six to seven? Sorry? Six to seven countries. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. yeah. Mm. Until I was about 11 or 12. And my father was a professor, but he was a traveling professor. Ah. So he went to a bunch of countries. And, you know, if you're a professor of accounting, it's a pretty universal teaching skill. Um, so he enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, and so he just kept traveling. And until so I think my mom said, well, the boys needed education and somewhere stable. To, so he ended up planting roots in Canada and that's what we end up sticking to. Interesting. And, and so I guess kind of go back to the story. So how do you, how do you then make these, uh, you know, you're thinking, okay, there's, there's something here, uh, math being foundational and being kind of like universal. Um, you go, okay, well, there's something really solid. Did you, uh, did you have any, uh, in terms of your relationship with money? Like, what was it? Was it like, did you never think about it? But, but I just can't imagine that could be mm. the case though, being somebody who chose the career path that you did, right? Because you're really at the forefront front of it um oh, well relationship with money was interesting because we grew up with uh not many means i mean my father was a professor but he was a professor that lived by his means never exceptionally rich and so on and so forth um we were always taught to never ask for more than we needed uh, we were always taught that greed is actually a very bad thing mm. and we were taught that uh people who are exceedingly rich are always going to go to hell that was the teaching that we always had. Um, mm. And that was the upbringing that I always had. So our relationship with money was more of a tool and not to essentially um, sort of, um, you know, gather or keep to ourselves. And um, coming to North America changed my perspective about it quite a bit because obviously you're surrounded by extremely capitalistic ideas. And so my thought about money and how it relates to money definitely changed after. Um, now when I'm much older, I, I see actually wisdom in, in that, in, in the earlier upbringings, but I, I do like to find a moderation between both. 
I think if there is this type of, I don't know, an ethical capitalist somewhere out there, um, that's probably a, a profile I would I'd gravitate towards. Um, but the value of Bitcoin and how it relates to money, I think the greed part of me wasn't activated. Um, it really was, it really was, I found a way to be able to excel in a field that I thought I was way behind. So the compliance field was already well developed and well flushed out in the space when crypto wasn't there yet. So me coming into compliance, I was going to start in a junior role in this very, very large place that already had a lot of incumbents. And I found a field that I could start and be the best at, at least even for a while, and at least stay good at it so that I can now, you know, be the emeritus like 10 years later that I, I, I have now amassed them out of knowledge. So I found a way to create a niche for myself. And that was, um, again, I, I think it goes back to my dad's teaching. He says, you know, you can study whatever you want, but make sure you find a niche because that's really your, that's really where, you know, you'll be the happiest is in a niche area. Um, so I, I, I was extremely excited to find a niche. Um, I was also, and still to this point, much better than before though, a lot of an introvert. So, you know, finding a career that's a niche as an introvert is amazingly exciting. It, it's like your dream come true. The last thing you want to do is find a, a field that's heavily saturated, not a niche as an introvert. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it seems like, I mean, there are a lot of introverts in Bitcoin. No, it's like that. I would say that's like the majority, uh, probably. I, I, mean, I mean, even myself, even though I'm like releasing two hours of videos a day, it's hard to say with a straight face. But I, I if I had to pick, you know, if somebody's like, Sunny, do we, you had one choice to live a intro. I think I really do enjoy my time alone. Like, uh, I have a comment about that. <laughs> I, I, have, I have a comment about that. I have a something to say it? about that. So for a while, when I was much younger, I used to be referred to as a geek right and or a nerd and it was seen it was a very pejorative way of calling somebody um years later it became a compliment i go i'm a nerd i'm a geek right <laughs> you just own and it I, yeah and, and it became it became fashionable it became yeah. fashionable to be called and get a geek or a nerd right i feel that's happening to the term introvert now a lot of people are fashionably introverts because <laughs> a lot of like a lot of like amazing things mm -hmm. have been invented by introverts are are essentially sold by introverts and being an introvert is seen somewhat fashionable. So, um, I don't know. I, I do I do see here and see a lot of people as introverts, and I mean it as a compliment to you, Sunny. I know you said you're an introvert, but I don't think you really are. I, I think, and I mean that as a compliment. I, I, think, <laughs> I think you're giving yourself the service by calling yourself like thousand up. person events and like Zoom no, because, uh, okay, or whatever. Let's the heck back this up for is, a second. Yeah. Are you are you or are you not in business development? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, oh, so no. how could you possibly? No, be it's like interview? it's kind of like it's kind of like when people ask GSP. G, you Saint ask Pierre's? him about sorry George St. Pierre your, yeah, your yeah. Montreal you know the, the best fighter the of all fighter. freaking yeah. time uh yeah. they ask he's like I hate I hate fighting he like the actual act of like in the ring like he's like I hate it um <laughs> but the training and everything before and after he loves it the lifestyle mm. so I, I kind of feel the same way is that you know I feel like I have a niche in terms of you know at a really young age my parents used to like put me on stage to like act and be the MC for this and that and so so, um, so yeah, and I, and I find like, especially in the engineering world, um, you know, because of that level of discomfort, most people don't, you know, you know, just don't want to even venture in that space. Like most entrepreneurs, like when I think about all the Bitcoin exchange owners out there in the world, how many are releasing daily videos, two hours a day, you know, it's like none of them. And I've challenged them to, because, because look, I mean, people ask me like, a lot of people are like, why are you even doing this? Like, it's a waste of your time. Like, what's your monetization strategy? Like, I don't know. I'm just having fun. Like it's, it's like, Oh really? Do you get discussions? Oh, I get lots. So many people, oh, you know, you spend too much much time on the story get to the point you know i'm like dude the, 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 this is the point like the story this is the point <laughs> um okay okay anyways uh, so okay so um so how, how do you break in so uh, by the way i think that's a beautiful insight there which is like you got to find a niche right because yeah it's just too noisy out there and you got to be the best at something so the fact that you married now compliance with bitcoin you're like all right let's go i like that um but still but still i think people can get stuck right it's like how do sure. you 
you like how do you like, what kind of litmus tests are you running like what kind of experiments do you do you start putting out there to be like okay is there really something here right because unless you're just stuck in your head otherwise <laughs> yeah so i have a thought about this so from a very early age and I, i'd like to think you and i have probably had the similar type of upbringing um you know one of the things that is always encouraged is that expose yourself to many things and then you're going to find what you like right that's what's always told expose yourself to many things and then you're going to find what you like I am old enough to be able to make this declaration that I think you should actually stick to one thing, very, very small thing. And then you'll be able to be exposed to other things that you might like. Because what happens when you're in a niche for a while, especially if you're a niche that you feel that you've got a good grasp on, there will be peripheral sort of domains or things that touch your area and you find that interesting in conjunction with what you're good at. Mm. And that allows you to branch a little bit more into the other things that I think everyone should, I think that people should always express them, um, expose themselves to things outside of what they're good at. But in order to be able to really find what things that you can be good at, you have to be, you know, you have to be very good at your own craft. Um, and then other things that are connected towards it are going to appeal to you and you'll be able to broaden your, your horizon that way. Um, the best example I can give is, um, there's a very well-known uh, leather craftsman here in Montreal who was really well, well renowned. And he started by only making watch straps made out of leather. And that was his thing. And he always did that. And he's always done that. Even massive, massive Swiss manufacturers order just from this guy to make custom leather uh, watch straps from him. But because he was doing this, he realized some of his buyers also liked having belts that were made out of leather. And then he decided to you know, he decided to go into that and then said, okay, things that are strips and leather. So straps, belts. And then he got into that field and now he's basically a leather craftsman. But he didn't go into the field thinking, I want to be a leather craftsman and then find something in leather that I'll be good at. He found something just by itself. He, he liked watches, he liked straps, he liked straps made out of leather, he specialized in it, and then it grew. So in my set, in for, for me, um, I was I was in compliance, then I was in crypto. So that was my super, super niche. Then while working in crypto and in compliance, I realized, okay, if I want to do this well, I can't use traditional systems for it. I need augmented systems, things that are based on machine learning. And then I got interested in AI and machine learning and then realized, oh, wait, uh, compliance and AI and machine learning, that's a whole different thing. So I now I'm now interested in that as well. And so it, it opens you up from all this um, if you're very, very interested into this one area. So, you know, I have two kids. You have three? two, 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 two as well. Yeah. Two, yeah. So, you know, I, I hope, I mean, obviously I'll try not to push them towards it, but I'll, I'll definitely encourage them to find a singular, singular thing inside a singular thing to be very, very interested in. And then what they really are interested in are going to come across once they're very good at their craft. And I hope I can, I hope I can instill that because that's, that's definitely the way I've seen it. I, mm. I appreciate that quite a bit. Uh, yeah, no, no, I, on, on, uh, you know, on the kind of the note of thanking parents and, and this note of, you know, uh, having a, a worldview um, and, and just focusing on something, I would say engineering for me was like that one thing mm. where it was like, probably the, one of the hardest things I'd ever done. I too had a best friend named Farouk who was like, you know, 10x smarter than me. And just because I hung out near him, I did, you know, I'd always like rank well in class, but it was yeah. only because of Farouk. <laughs> Intelligence um, by osmosis. Yeah. By osmosis, it's the best way. You know, we'd be in the library literally all the time. I just peek over and Farouk, I'm stuck again. He's like, dude, yeah. you haven't even moved a question. He's like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I was going to say, but but I think the, the engineering thing for me gave me the confidence to not fear things that look complex, whether it be Bitcoin or for example, this weekend I was, I downloaded something called Logic Pro. It's like a music creation software for like okay. Apple. And it was a little bit intimidating, but I was like, you know, I got this. I got, I got, I got the, you know, and I just worked through it. And, you know, it was crazy. Like by the end of like last night, I was like actually impressed with myself. I was like, this is cool. So I it's just, you can like, whether it's like shoveling a driveway or whatever, you can just be like systematic about it. But anyways, anyways, but okay. So we're still kind of in like what, 2013, 2014 region, right? Like, so yeah. I'm just curious. So what do you, how do you, yeah. Like shift gears now into. Uh, yeah. So. Here I am, compliance officer of Buttercoin, and now there's this whole thing where we have to have regulatory. Um, so you, you've got to have there's a whole regulatory guidance on the federal side, and and suddenly there there is a whole obligation on the state side now. 
And holy hell, how the hell do you go about that? Because there isn't really a playbook behind it. So I literally had a regulatory council that I trusted quite a bit. And I said, um, uh, hey, can you can you help me figure out how to delve into this state space? And she goes, well, the regulators in the states probably also don't know how to answer you if you ask them whether your business model applies to them or not. And they're going to look they're going to look at you through the lens of their um, you know, their applications. So one by one, state by state, letters were written, you know, describing the business, how it, how it is, how it's supposed to work and get an idea from the state. Um, and we had to explain crypto. I know that there were two states. We actually had to get on the phone call and explain to them what cryptocurrency was before we got an opinion as to whether it applied or not. Um, that was an amazing exercise, but at the same time, the I would think that the best part of my experience at Buttercoin, by the way, was designing onboarding systems. Um, so how, you know, how we refer to as KYC, when you mm -hmm. identify somebody and you bring them on, especially on a retail facing transaction scenario. My, my, my fun, I don't know if you remember this, Sunny, was working with the developers on creating onboarding flows that were as unobstructive as possible, right? That were not meant to have any like people would be able to just sign on without jumping through many many hoops and just retesting and reiterating what what's the best way to do that was probably my most fun time doing that because i can tell you with confidence i see a lot of new companies in the space that are designing their kyc and onboarding system and holy crap are they horrible um I think what's happened here is that they've forgotten that they're supposed to, like even the compliance officer at a payment or crypto firm forgets that his duty is, is to the client at all times. If you're a profit-making company, your duty is to the client at all time. And your duty is to the good client, right? So you need to design a system that is the best experience for your good customer. Your developers are building tools or software and services for their best customer, your business development team are, the compliance officer needs to also build his onboarding flow for his best customer. And right now, and because there's this big thing about new banks and challenger banks being this really you know huge thing, both in, in the Europe and, and also in North America, there's like new banks everywhere, it's like mushrooms. Virtually all of their onboarding flows are designed as if they're onboarding a, a, a criminal. So the way they onboard someone and they make them go through verification steps assumes that the customer present themselves is intending to deceive them. So when they give, when they have them verify like two, three different ways, you're gonna be able to have access to the smallest product possible. What you're essentially doing is essentially saying, look, I don't trust a single customer that's going to present themselves. So I need to vet you through the lens of as if you are intending to deceive me. And then if you are able to pass that KYC and verification status, now I'm happy. What a terrible way to treat a customer. Can I say something about that just real quick? Sure. So, so I think that's such an interesting insight. Um, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think why this issue is happening because technical entrepreneurs such as myself we think in binary one zero terms and we usually think the first person that you logically would think to ask these types of questions is the lawyer that you're hiring that you know incorporated you or whatever whatever and lawyers will oftentimes prescribe a very onerous type of kyc procedure and say these are the laws and this is what you need to do if and so it's almost coming at it from like a worst case scenario um and I think that's kind of where like compliance experts come in, right? That's kind of the place is to be able to understand what the lawyer is saying, be able to understand who, um, what the customer needs are and be able to like in a risk adjusted way, build a user experience that is optimal, um, that protects the business, that's doing the right. Am I, they butchered that. <laughs> I just, no, you, you, butcher, that you, out? You, no you, you, you made the, you said the right thing, which is yeah, a yeah. lot of times the re regulatory guidelines are written out by lawyers, very, very competent lawyers who essentially write out, these are the requirements. Developers obviously want to be able to scale that requirement and essentially put things in place that are literal copies of what the words written on the legal opinion. The problem you have is this regulations for the most part and how to apply it is an art code 
is a science. So in order to be able to put art into code, you can't sort of draw out and exactly what the art is. So how you onboard is somebody, you know, the, there's an old standing regulation that your onboarding has to be risk-based. They aren't kidding. It essentially means if you feel it presents a high risk, then ask for that amount of information related to the risk that you feel that it'll present. But when I see sort of compliance and KYC um, sign up forms that are the absolute, you know, most heaviest way of onboarding somebody on a customer that's intending to only buy $10 worth of whatever, I ask myself, what risk did you see in that $10 transaction to need that? And I believe that that's a lot that has to do with laziness because it's extremely mm -hmm. easy to put together a very, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of heavy kind of thing. And by the way, I shouldn't be one to sort of, you know, preach the choir here. I've made my share amount of mistakes. Holy shit, have I made a lot of mistakes in my past. When I'm talking about when I was a compliance analyst at investment company and when I was a compliance at high risk payment processing, the amount of mistakes I've made, I mean, it's nothing compared to this, especially when you're talking about KYC and regulations and all that. I mean, I've made my share of mistakes, but I've made that mistakes and a lot of people have that. And I hoped that those would be able to be used to provide guidance to people that are building compliance systems today. And unfortunately hasn't still changed. And the person paying the price is still the customer. So when new banks, for example, are dying one by one, um, even though there's a lot happening and they have a hard time sort of picking up customers. And if you ask their business development guys to check the funnel between customers that come in and actually sign up and actually onboard and go through and have create that first transaction, which is translated to what we call a customer acquisition cost or customer, customer acquisition tunnel, you're going to see that there's a huge drop off. That huge drop off is essentially because you put them through a journey where the vast amount of what they've done has done nothing with interacting with your service. They've not actually done anything. You've put them through something that has not beneficial towards you. So you've cost yourself money and the person hasn't spent with you. So new banks are going to have a hard, hard time sort of competing here and really taking off if A, their onboarding scenario, their first interactions with their customer are identical to the partner banks that they're with, right? And that's tragic because they invest so much on marketing on getting people through that signup place that there is so much drop off after purely because you're just codifying regulations and hoping that it'll work because marketing dollars should come in handy and should be able to push the customers right through. No, no. The customer that you market it to doesn't want to put up with this bullshit. So you need to figure out a way on a stepping the kind of way you onboard them versus the risk and having a vast amount of analytics on the users that are coming in. So you can really identify, is this customer going to pose a risk? How much pressure should I put in identifying them as they come into my system and as they go through the different services through my system? They don't do that. Newer banks are all going to look the same. Challenger banks are all going to look the same. And the only person that's going to be able to win is the ones that are selling loan products. That's it. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I think there's a ton of, uh, ton of great, you know, insights there, man. I think that's, that's, that's yeah. Bang on. Um, yeah, I, but I can definitely, you know, I can, I can see why that issue occurs because, you know, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And I think that a lot of people just don't know that that, and they're just like, okay, don't want any risk there. Don't want to go to jail. Don't want to, uh, you know, and that's literally the driving factor. And you're just like, okay, you know, if we have to get put, put up barriers, put up barriers, but you're right. But then how are you building a business? Like, and, 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 you know, and if people are wondering why we're talking about, you know, or why I'm interested in Buttercoin in our days, it should be noted that, I mean, not only do we not lose any, you know, money for people or whatever and whatever, whatever but I think the experience was like, it, it lived up to its name. It was like butter. <laughs> I mean, the, the, <laughs> we had, we had ACH. Yeah. Yeah. We had ACH in 2013. Mm -hmm. And I think the total loss that we had over the entire two years over ACH was something like 10,000. Mm which is insane given that amount of time. And we were, we were getting gamed a lot. I don't know whether you remember, we were getting gamed a, a lot. Like people were trying to, so a lot of attackers were trying to simulate the whole selfie thing and they were hiring people. Okay. To pose. They essentially were ID mules. They were essentially using those people's ID to pass through and essentially go through the whole experience itself. But 
I think we had a we had a lot of appreciation for the customer. Um, and because when you appreciate the customer enough, you want to make that experience as, as good as possible. And, and I, I've always, you know, looked for people that are in the compliance space that actually care about their customer because it's very difficult to find. <laughs> yeah. As well. Um, I, by the way, I did interview Bennett as well, who is the CTO Bennett, of Buttercoin sure, yeah. recently. He's uh, he's awesome. Um, okay. So I, I mean, I guess like has your journey kind of looked similar in that sense? Like, have you been have you been working with I guess companies on that range over the last uh, you know since then in terms of yeah. like, kind of solve similar? What what's been the journey for you there? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So after Buttercoin, what was really interesting is that I realized that initially when I had come into the payment processing space, I hadn't actually focused a lot of compliance in that area. And I went back into compliance for card acquiring companies. So a lot of compliance that was in the payment facilitator space. What that essentially means is if you're a software company and you want to become your own PayPal, you become a payment facilitator. Um, Or you want to become your own Stripe, you become a payment facilitator. I learned that because I was director of compliance at Bolt, which is a company right after Buttercoin, and Bolt is doing extremely well. I'm still advisor for them. But I realized that a lot of software companies wanted to become their own payment company. Um, And so they needed to be a payment facilitator. So I helped like a few banks work um, and, and, and sort of have a compliance program that worked with them. But what I really found interesting was after that whole phase of crypto companies that either died or where the founders went to jail, things like mm-hmm. that. There was a new age of crypto companies that came in that were really thinking very, very carefully about what's the best value I can give to an everyday person. And they came up with ideas about how to develop those. Uh, I was called in for to like provide advice for a lot of different uh, pay, um, crypto slash payment hybrid companies because now they're trying to marry both worlds together. Um, a lot of them were terrible ideas um, or, or very sort of ideas that didn't have any path to execution, at least that I hadn't seen. And only a few of them came up. And I've been working with a few of them. I think one of them is, I can talk about them publicly. Um, it's a company called Echo. Um, Andy Bromberg is CEO of Echo. And if you ever get the chance to uh, speak to anyone from Echo, you should definitely do it. Uh, they are building what I think is one of the most compelling um, value propositions in the cryptocurrency space. Um, you know. Bitcoin is obviously great, but I don't, I don't think as well that that is how consumers are always going to transact. Um, I have my reservations on Bitcoin as a means of consumer payments. Um, I just don't see something that is, that doesn't, that doesn't preserve privacy as a way of a proper way for customers to transact. And I, I find that, you know, Bitcoin is, it violates heavily your, your privacy. Um, and, I don't think that's I don't think that's a good thing for for cons- I mean look I shouldn't probably say this because if people want to be able to use Bitcoin to make payments they should that's fine I think that if if you care about your privacy you really should not use Bitcoin and if I'm going to if I'm going to have someone who is not technically savvy to be able to use cryptocurrency I'm going to advise them to use an extremely public cryptocurrency. It's like, you know, we teach everyone that's not in cryptocurrency, for example, to always keep your information private, always keep your social network private, don't divulge anything, don't do anything that uh, divulges your, you know, personal information, but then we want them to use Bitcoin. It doesn't make sense. Like, I don't know why we would suggest when on one hand, we're telling people to have very, very private lives and, you know, have good privacy hygiene in all of their other tools. At the same time, also use Bitcoin, which is not privacy preserving at all. Then there are a lot of other coins that are much better at preserving your privacy. Um, and I think Bitcoin should is going to be the, the the sort of mother coin of all coins. And institutions probably are going to be more involved in it than anything else. Um, so I think of cryptocurrency more as a tool to be able to help, you know, bridge that gap from the traditional space into the crypto space. And Echo is doing quite a bit, and I and I love what they're doing. I love their whole idea behind it. Um, so I've been helping them with that and you should get a chance to talk to them. They're worth it. They would love it. Yeah. If you have, if you know someone there would love to get an intro and, and, uh, yeah, talk to those guys. Um, but yeah, man, sorry. There's just so many interesting things that you're saying here. I'm trying to like catch on all of them, but okay. So Faisal, what, um, uh, you know, I, I just realized also that we were, also, we're already like 65 minutes into this. Um, so I wanted to maybe shift gears and ask you one of sure. my kind of, so we've talked about your kind of, you know, Bitcoin experience, your story. We talked a bit about, you know, um, your journey as like a compliance ninja. I know you don't like that term, but I like it <laughs> uh, in the Bitcoin well, space. A, a ninja, is, a ninja, uh, ninja. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's traditionally been an 
outlaw and i don't like to want to think that i'm a compliance outlaw but so. <laughs> okay terrible terrible idea what do you prefer what do you like uh, let's just call it enthusiast i have i'm a great uh, admirer of it and which it, is which it. is which is such a disgusting thing to say that i'm enthusiastic about compliance but i i like the whole field and how it evolves inside fintech payments and crypto it, it, yeah right i wanted to say one thing on your whole kind of uh bitcoin thing I, I agree with you to a large extent that it's not private um it can be to some extent you have to go to great lengths i think because i mean who, who's satoshi right meaning like i mean we might know but i'm just saying it's still a bit of an open-ended question so i think it's possible but i also for the think for the average human being it's it's it's, it's a bit of a challenge uh and so i don't recommend uh it as like a tool for for privacy like you said unfortunately um but i think because it lacks those elements it's also I don't want to say this, but it's like, it's kind of like the, the Trojan horse, if you will. You know what I mean? And I think it, it, for me, ultimately, the evil that Bitcoin rids us of is inflation. Um, and, 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 you know, if you think about, you know, the strategy of just like hodling, uh, when we met, Bitcoin was, I don't know, $10 or whatever, $100 or something. Mm -hmm. Today, it's sitting at, you know, whatever, 30, 40 grand, 50 grand. Uh, so I, I definitely would have maybe, yeah, I, I see some value in, in, like I said, uh, the asset element of it, but, but definitely agree with you that privacy is lacking in a big way. Look, individuals hodling are not going to, are not the things that are going to move the needle anymore. It used to be the case, but now it's institutions that are hodling that are going to really move the needle. And it's just like every other situation in there. After a while, when institutions get involved, individuals have less, you know, buying power, or at least voting power inside of that mechanism. So um, you then think to how do you use it? And, you know, if there are currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies that exist that are by default private, I think that's a better way to be able to give to someone who is not very good at, at privacy hygiene. So they, they just are not competent enough to be able to do it. I thought there was always this narrative around how Bitcoin is open source. You can make Bitcoin private if, you know, there was enough demand for it and da, 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 like, do you think that one maybe doesn't have enough as, as much weight on it just because of the way it is and it's like the ossification of Bitcoin or whatever? Um, so you're asking whether if there is more emphasis on that, whether it might become popular? Yeah, I'm or... saying it's like it's open source. So could it not, is it not foreseeable that Bitcoin itself could upgrade no, it's, itself? It's, uh, it's, it's too big and it's too big. In my opinion, it's too big and too financially vested by institutions for really anything gearing towards that really on the private scale maybe it'll be like sort of like buying privacy so you if you pay you get the privacy but institutions are the ones that are demanding privacy right yeah because, because i mean people don't it's not privacy isn't about you know running or being a criminal privacy is about i don't want my maybe my competitor or i don't want my neighbor to know you know how much yeah, money i have institutions whatever. have the resources to be able to invest in the kind of privacy that's needed to be really right. make it private Right. So if I have a hundred million that I need to hide and I'm an institution, or I don't want anyone else to know that I've got a hundred million in assets stored on the blockchain, then I have the resources to be able to spend, to be able to make it private. Got but it. Yeah. Makes sense. I don't think that yeah. option is available to someone who is storing 10,000. That's all their life savings mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then spend it after. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Uh, okay. So Faisal, um, this so is one of my, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, finale questions, right. Is, is really around what is one truth that you hold that most others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? So it's like Peter Thiel's famous, like contrarian question, right. Applied to Bitcoin. So once again, what is one truth that you hold that most others, uh, in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? Um, Sure. I mean, I think it, it's probably I mean, the, our whole conversation technically, but still, well, I mean, I, I think it's the tail. I, I would say that it's the tail end of what I just told you about. I think mm -hmm. Bitcoin is probably the, the single best discovery we've ever made. Um, but I also think it's probably the worst cryptocurrency for, um, you know, individuals to use um, simply because of the privacy thing. I love that, it. It's that, juicy. That Juicy, juicy. Okay. Um, okay. Actually, you know what? Okay. There are a couple of like uh, trailer ones here and I, and I am excited about asking you because it came up in the conversation. So um, talk to me about machine learning uh, and talk to me about AI and talk to me a little bit about, okay. So narrow bands of AI, right? The Tesla driving itself, Google, Bitcoin, 
these are exciting, but just to get really, you know, ended off on a saucy note, right? This sure. whole notion of general uh, AI that, you know, even people <laughs> like uh, Elon Musk, Zuckerberg, these guys are talking about it. It is a thing now, even Bill Gates, right? So w- what are your thoughts on it? Like this whole, you know, the singularity, if you will, you know, we're probably still a few decades away, but do you do you buy into this 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 whole like you know that uh you'll be able to buy a thousand dollar computer that's cheaper that, and they'll be able to do anything and everything that a human can and that is like you know sentient etc cetera, etc cetera. do you think that's like in our horizon um <laughs> um look there's a sadistic part of me that says oh i'd love that <laughs> You know, I'd love this whole like, because all the things you talk about, like cataclysms and so on, that actually yeah, yeah. happens and AI overlords everywhere, which is why I love AI. I want that to be recorded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you're listening, AI, AI gods in I the love future. You. Yes, you are our masters. Um, but my, my thing is that I think that future and eventuality is one of two likelihoods, right? One is where it goes positive and the other where it goes negative. But we're missing, I feel like by, so I love that we're having discussions about the potential distant future. I love that because that's amazing. That's also romantic. And I love talking about those. But I feel like by talking a lot and putting more energy about on that, we're missing out on things we can do while we get to that journey. And I feel like the more we talk about the distant future and the less we do about work right now, we're actually accelerating that future. So what I would probably ask for people is, what are things with AI that you can do now that will greatly enhance your life and your understanding of everything? Okay, let's the go more there. You do that, the more you do that, the more you'll be able to figure out what the future actually looks like. And I mentioned AI and ML and machine learning, but it's actually from my context. I work in compliance and I work with companies and provide them anti-money laundering advice. I'm doing that because of all the mistakes that I've made in the past. And I've also seen all the great things that I've been able to do. And the only thing that can keep up with developers trying to put all that in place is actually machine learning. Machine learning is the single best way for the modern compliance officer to be able to do the things that, um, all the things that they need to do. Because on the other side, whether that's illicit individuals and criminals, their life and the criminal's life is very much gamified and they're using AI and machine learning to be able to conduct all their activities on a massive scale. So it only makes sense for a compliance officer at a payments company or remittance company to use machine learning and AI as a basis to be able to defend themselves at scale. So that's where my interest comes in. And I feel like by doing that and understanding more and more about that, I'm playing my part in the overall big AI and ML game so that we can all use that to really understand what our end future looks like you know, in that state. I've had a hard time, man. I have a hard, like, just, just like how I had a hard time convincing compliance officers back in 2012 about crypto. I'm having a hard time convincing um, compliance officers about machine learning. I mean, they just, they are just not getting it. Either they're not getting it or they don't want to get it. I don't know what it is, but the way I tell them is that, look, don't think of machine learning and AI as like HAL 9000 or, you know, deep blue or anything like that. It's not that, <laughs> right? It, yeah. It's basically a yeah. giant calculator that calculates infinitely. Thank That's you. what I think. I, I, when, I, when I say it's a giant calculator <laughs> that calculates infinitely, yeah. they get it. They get Humongous. it. They get it. They're like, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Now okay, I okay, okay. Um, I like that. I like that. Can, and then the human is very much a, a, a really, really important part of that, that equation. Um, so I, I believe in that. I believe in the next frontier of compliance using AI and ML so much so that, uh, you know, there's a company out in Amsterdam that said, hey, we'd like for you to come and work with us. And I said, yep, I'm going to Amsterdam to do that. Cool. Cool. Uh, yeah. Yes. So I like that, man. Uh, by the way, I recently got access to OpenAI. Have you played with no, it? No, but I've read every single thing that came out of it. <sighs> you, saw the, you saw the recent thing from... Uh, we should do a call, like a private call. You saw the thing about, do a screen the, the, so there's a picture that's been shared all the time about avocados, right? You text a type, right? You, you type it out and AI actually generates based on your text. You seen that? Uh, sorry, I'm trying to think of that particular. I've seen a lot of examples. It's the doll like models. Essentially, you type it out and whatever you type, yeah. it, for, it forms objects based on what you've typed, <sighs> which is insane. Because imagine giving that engine to J.R.R. R. Tolkien. He could have put the movie into existence by typing out his book. Can you even imagine that? That you can actually oh build your goodness. own movies based on the books you're writing? I mean, that's insane. It's crazy. 
wowzers okay mind blasting they would say but wow that is insane that's an amazing angle as soon as i saw that they were able to type words and machines were able to generate the pictures based on the words yeah i was like this is from my fantasy background i was like this is it you type it and you've got worlds appearing as you type it oh i I think i think the future will belong to writers um because like i said if you look at open ai and as i'm playing with it i used to always have this insecurity where i've had so many programming classes like that you wouldn't even believe i've had jobs where it was my job to program and i'm the suckiest program in the world like i i try not to program ever because it's not my strength with what I see coming out of OpenAI, I think there will be a world very, very soon where guys like me will be able to just like literally write and and it'll just generate the code in the back. Um, exactly. It is insane. So, so yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I think being like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so exciting. Um, one more thing, one more thing, one more yeah. thing. Do you think, uh, do you think uh, this whole notion of like, do, do you think, do you think that AI also in its like various forms pose Mm, a bit of an existential threat. I mean, and I, I'm a big Tesla fan as well, right? So my car literally, dude, drives itself, okay? Uh, there's a lot of people who drive for a living, right? Uber drivers, et cetera, truck drivers. And, you know, that's just one job that I could see maybe disappearing in the next five to 10 years. And if you're going to go to all those truck drivers and be like, you should learn how to program, they might be struggling because it's like, they don't need to because OpenAI does that. <laughs> But my, so my point is like, where are people to go? Um, and I hate, I hate asking this question because I feel like a Luddite and I'm not, I'm the complete opposite, but I do think about these things because I think they matter um, potentially. <laughs> because we've relegated to machines our whole life, different functions of things we used to do, whether that's washing or cleaning or doing, we've relegated now to mission. And the last frontier that we haven't relegated yet and we are fearful of is thinking. Is the last thing we thought that no one would be able to take that from us is thinking. And we've essentially are building things to be able to take that last thing that we, so once they take that from us, we feel like, well, now we're useless. Now we're exactly in the first matrix where it's essentially just a power tool to be able to serve it. Yeah, maybe. But I mean, there is thinking and then there's human thinking. And I think a lot of the human thinking will still exist. And I think we're we're really going to enjoy that. Um, I think a lot of the cognitive and burdensome thinking that's more toilsome is going to be taken off our hands because all thinking is not the same, right? There is thinking that's designed for work and then there's thinking that's designed for enjoyment of life. And I think you won't be able to replicate the enjoyment of life one because that's very much based on our emotions and so on. Um, So we are fearful because the last thing we haven't relegated back to machines is thinking. And we're very scared that that's what they're going to take away. And that, that essentially is taking our, all of our purpose, all of our virtue. I mean, what's that line? I think therefore I am right. So if now I don't think, I guess now I am not. And that's the fear. (laughs) Um, So I I would say, I I think it's, we're worried about it, but we have to also think that there are things, when we think of the things, there are types of things that we think about that are not essential to enjoyment of life. And if AIs can take that off our plate, I think it's gonna give us more option to be able to enjoy more and think about things that actually make us enjoy more. Well said, well said. And uh, you know, I've also been talking about, I talked to Max Kaiser about this in our interview, but I recently waking up to the fact that in some ways, Bitcoin kind of helps you to like reverse the hands of time. <laughs> like, I don't know, okay, so let me just rephrase that. So before I discovered Bitcoin, there would always be more months than money. You know what I mean? Like you're always waiting for that paycheck because <laughs> there's always a couple extra days. Uh, but when oh, I had a mental shift yeah. towards like more valuing my value in terms of Bitcoin, um, all of a sudden, I don't know, things just started changing. Uh, um, and so anyway, so this is probably like a, a you know different conversation. Hey, Faisal, oh God, listen. I could have so much about this. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I'm down for part two, part three, anytime. <laughs> this has been crazy fun. Uh, and, and, you know, the first one is more like an intro stories, but like, bro, there is so much stuff happening. Like the most, like w- w- it doesn't matter what you think of like Trump or whatever, right? But just the sure. most powerful man on, on earth was just deplatformed. I mean, I Mimi, mean, he's not today, but I mean, he was like a month ago. I'm pretty sure everybody would have agreed. Today, he's being deplatformed, unbanked, da 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 It's like, what? Like, 
Ah. Okay, so maybe uh, maybe G- Trump G- needs life. to start a new bank and needs to call you up because they need to have some Bitcoin integration. Boom, oh, I, my I, no, drop, I'm baby. Just, I don't know. I'm just too, I'm <laughs> just too jealous of his hair. No, I'm just too jealous of his hair. hair. I don't have good enough hair. I don't think I'm able to compete. You I know? love his hair. But um, the, look, if ever you want to talk again, the one thing that I'll say that I, I find the most interesting that I is also another frontier after AI is our data and as data as currency. That is something that I've slowly delved into. And one of our ex-colleagues in Buttercoin, Tani, yeah, I remember. You should hit her up. She's working on something that is pretty amazing um, with regards to, you know, our data, our online data, personal data, and how that can be considered potentially as currency and how do you create an infrastructure around it? Well, it right. is, right? Google recognized that. Facebook yes, recognized that. What if you could reap the benefits yeah. of it, right? That's yeah. interesting in itself. What, what is that working mean? on? What is Tanya the, working on? We should ask her. Okay, I'll ask her. I'm, I'll, I'm pointing I'll, you towards the direction. But let me let me let me tell you this. Yeah. Like for example, if I was to tell you that my data is currency and I am selling my data or exchanging my data, yeah, am I committing money transmission? Because now I've I've essentially monetized my data. Am I am I infringing some regulatory guidelines with regards to financial transactions? Because now my data is engaged in a financial transaction. Yeah, right. And and I mean, we That's haven't even touched on, yeah, our, our spaces. I mean, this space is moving fast. I think AI, there's a lot. And this is why I've been like so compelled, man, to just like come online every day and just share thoughts because something magical is starting to happen because I'm kind of out there. I know most people don't watch my shit, right? Like my mom, like I just force her to keep a window open on her computer every now and then just to, <laughs> yeah. But, but, um, but I like, I just, my, 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 one of my main reasons is I feel that there's probably a lot of people right now in this pandemic kind of situation that are alone maybe, or just, maybe they just, I don't know. They feel like Fashionably I, introverts, yes. Fashionably yes, introverts, and uh, <laughs> no, but they want to hear about people's thoughts in general. It doesn't always have to be structured. It doesn't exactly. always have to be routine. Sometimes it's just like overhearing two people talking, and you know, there are parts of it you might th- there, there might might there might things there are things that you might think that are you know interesting, and some things that that are not. But it's one of those you know sort of impromptu conversations, and that you have all the time with all the individuals that you speak to. It's just hearing two guys speak, and where it doesn't yeah. feel like it's scripted all the time. Because and, and for me, I really landed on this Faisal mainly because like you know I was doing those events, right? Like mm. huge events, and and at one point I was on stage. I forget with who. I think it was Edmund Moy, the the thirty eight director, or and I was just like just really enjoying the experience of getting to ask this person questions and then knowing that it's whoops that it's being shared you know or that there's an audience full of people was just amazing but i can do that with like a zoom call now and it's like i don't need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and three course meals and people can just enjoy yeah. it from their home and Absolutely. you know events are not even a thing anymore so okay faisal uh, on a finish note where do people uh you know tap into your consciousness like is it i don't know do you blog do you have a website twitter is it or are you, i guess you no, said you're I, an introvert I'm, right so i guess they're not gonna <laughs> they're shit out of luck <laughs> um, no i'm i'm an, I, I would like to say i'm an ex-introvert um and i'm very much enjoying being an extrovert when you Love have it. a little daughter that's just you just have to be an extrovert in that sense um <laughs> but no i'm i'm both mostly on linkedin um faisal islam you can just find me on there and i'm you know, i posted there and there and if ever, everyone anyone wants to ever get in touch and so on and what i'm going to be working on um you know, always up to talk. And and are you are you because I know sometimes you're uh, not locked down, but you're locked down. I hate that word now. But you're you're uh, you know on gigs where you where a company just brings you on and you can't really help others. Or are you in that stage, or are you in a place where if others are like, hey, this guy seems super legit, like I want to work with them, are are you able to take on new customers at this time? Just curious. Well, it's only case by it, case. It depends maybe. on what. It, it, yeah, it only depends on what the project is. Uh, one of Got the things it. I told, um, and, and I can share a little bit more about not yet because official data is coming soon. But uh, the company I've been working with, they're very open and they're great. And if there's a synergy, I definitely look forward to it. That'd be great. But it's Sweet. It's, it's it's less about whether I can and more about whether I want to because ah. Lord knows there are a lot of bad ideas out there. And I really don't want to be involved in a lot of bad ideas. I mean, yeah. if, I, if I can't give you any value, I don't see why I should take money from you. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, man. Totally agree with that. Well, anyways, Faisal, you're you're someone who's had a, a huge impact on my thinking, my worldview, and the way I ugh, approach product compliance. I mean, you're you're really a wizard, dude. So thank you uh, for coming on this call Ninja, and uh, wizard. 
ninja ninja wizard yeah yeah yeah, yeah. dude it's all we're, we're not enthusiast it's it's, it's enthusiast, a right? enthusiast enthusiast is very much like a compliment it just sounds a little blah but okay i'll go with enthusiast come on oh i i suffer <laughs> from imposter well i think it's because i suffer from imposter syndrome so it helps me <laughs> okay but okay i'm gonna bring this one to a close hang out for like two seconds here sure. uh anything else any last words or are we good no, I think it's great. I think we talked about it and I'm looking forward to chatting again. This was actually more fun than I thought it was going to be. Right? Right. Okay. I'm going to kill. All right. Thanks, man. Okay. Close.